The kid was talking. I had to keep him talking before he wised up and started asking for a lawyer. I lit a smoke and handed it to Joel through the bars of the cell. He gave me a surprised look, then took it with a trembling hand. After a deep drag, he said, thank you. I won't tell your parents if you don't. That was another thing, his parents. I hadn't notified them yet, but I would have to do that soon enough. I was surprised they hadn't heard the news already. I wanted Joel's story before they had a chance to get between us. So anyway, later that day, Noah made an excuse to go down to the school basement. That's where they kept the Louis costume. He said he had to check on something, but really what he did was unlock one of the windows down there. At night, we rode our bikes over and slipped in through that window. It was so easy, and we could have done so many different things instead of what we did. We could have written messages on the chalkboards, could have fucked with Principal Keeler's office. Anything but the janitor's closet. Joel finished his smoke and dropped it into the dingy toilet with a sizzle. Then he leaned his mouth under the faucet of the sink there and took a quick drink of water. We headed upstairs and down the dark halls, using our phones to light the way. But once we got to the closet, there was another kind of light. A green light seeping out from the closet through the gaps around the door. Noah saw that and wanted to call the thing off. I told him. He choked back a harsh sob and went on. I told him to stop being a pussy, that the janitor had just left the light on by accident or something, and I went to work on the lock. I'd watched a YouTube video, and after a minute or two, I had it open. I was so proud of myself. Pride goeth before the fall, officer. Pride goeth before the fucking fall. We were going to scatter plastic bones and stuff like that around and start taking pictures. That was the plan. But as soon as I opened that door, the green light spilled out. I saw that it was coming from a crack in the wall. At first, it was swirling everywhere, like an aimless fog, but it started to coil together like a snake. Noah started screaming, and the snake of light took his open mouth as a sort of invitation. It wormed its way inside of him, until it was gone completely, and everything was dark again. I cleared my throat. I don't want to sound insensitive, Joel, but I have to ask, did you maybe take some pills or smoke a little something before this all happened? Joel shook his head. I'm not gonna get high before I do something like this. Break into the school. You crazy? It happened. I saw it. And after that, Noah wasn't the same. We got out of there fast, forgetting the stupid prank, and we got back on our bikes. Noah made me escort him home. He kept asking what the fuck had happened, what the fuck had slithered inside of him. I told him I didn't know, maybe some kind of weird gas leak. I said maybe he should go to the dock for a checkup, just to be safe. When he got to his house, we said goodnight, and he went inside. He wasn't at school the next day. I kept texting him, but he didn't respond. I pulled my own phone out and checked it again for missed messages. No word from anybody, God damn it! But I saw him that night, at 1 a.m., in my fucking bedroom. I woke up, and there he was, at the foot of my bed, staring down at me. His eyes were glowing green in the darkness. Before you ask, yeah, I'd been smoking a little weed before bed, but Jesus Christ, not that much. Man. So I tried to tell myself, it's just sleep paralysis, dude, calm down. <sighs> I couldn't though. Not when Noah walked over and started stroking my forehead. His touch felt so real. And cold. He leaned down and started whispering in my ear. He said, I'm growing stronger again, and soon I'll be everywhere. I'll be in your closet, 
and I'll be in your mama. I'll be dripping from the faucet. And soon, very soon, my pal, I will drip all over this world and transform it into the screaming hell that it wants to be. Do you see? And I did see. I saw my dad coming home from work. He was covered in blood, had just stabbed his foreman 63 times. He was screaming at my mom, demanding to know what was for dinner. She said he was for dinner and bashed his skull in with a meat tenderizer. I watched, frozen in terror, and heard wails outside. Human wails, people moaning in agony, and wails of sirens cut short as ambulances crashed into each other. Through the window, I could see a green fog overlaying everything, and I could see people running down the street with missing limbs or the flesh flayed from their faces, and other people chasing them, and other people chasing those people armed with golf clubs, gardening shears, guns. I was a rational man and believed that at best this was all a fever dream or a bad trip, but still I shivered. So you felt like you had to stop him, I said gently. Yes, I mean, Jesus Christ, I didn't want to do it. Who wants to shoot their best friend? But that wasn't Noah anymore. That was some, a demon or something. I don't know what it was, just that it was evil, and it had to be stopped, and nobody would believe me if I went for help. And I know you don't believe me either. I know I'm fucked. My entire life is fucked. I sighed and lit two more cigarettes. One for him, one for me. I believe that you believe what you're saying, I said. I know it wasn't easy for you to tell me that either, and I appreciate your cooperation. I'm going to call your parents now and tell them what you did, on the off chance that they haven't heard by now. Do you have their number? Joel gave me the number, then sucked on his cigarette in gloomy silence. I left him in his cell. Back in my office, I sat down and waited for my heartbeat to slow. Was there some part of me, some little sliver of my lizard brain, that actually believed that crap? If there was, I had to push it aside and focus on the next steps. I'd call Joel's parents. But first, I had to know what was happening at the hospital. I tried the boys over the radio. No response. I tried texting Bud, the EMT. Nothing. I dialed up the hospital and listened to the line ring and ring. I hung up and decided that Joel's parents could wait. I had to find out what the hell was going on. And if nobody would answer, I'd have to haul my ass over there and see the situation with my own eyes. I pushed myself out of the chair. It took an effort, and my knees cracked when I stood. I was getting old and beyond tired. As I scooped up my keys, there was a great crash out in the hallway, followed by a harsh scraping sound. I put my hand on the weapon strapped to my hip and hustled to the door. Was that a lobster tail? Damn it, it was. The door separating the public area of the police station from the holding cells had been shattered apart, and the giant tail was disappearing into the darkness left in its wake. I heard Joel scream. I took a deep breath, steadied myself, then broke into a sprint down the hallway toward the cells. I nearly slipped and looked down to see that I was following a trail of green slime. The pit in my stomach turned into a gorge, and then, when I made it to the cells, it opened up into an endless abyss. Louis the Lobster stood tall, with his scaled back facing me, snapping his formidable pincers in the air. Joel was shouting in wide-eyed terror, Shoot it! Shoot it! My mind scrambled to make sense of what I was seeing. Louis the Lobster, mascot for the Claremont Claws. I knew that. My son played for the Claws. Tonight was his first game, and during halftime of that game, 
I'd watch Joel Clements shoot three bullets into Louis the Lobster, who wasn't really a lobster, but a boy named Noah. And that boy was dead. My EMT friend, Bud, had told me that. That was right, wasn't it? But if it was right, then what the fuck was this thing in front of me, snapping its claws? Shoot it, wailed Joel. Please. I drew my gun, more because I didn't know what else to do than out of any intention of using it. Halt, I said. Put your claws. Hands up. Louis ignored my command and began reaching his pincers towards the bars of the cell. Jesus fucking Christ. Shoot it. Shoot it. Shoot it. Shoot it. But I didn't shoot it. There was a boy in there. He must have somehow survived the bullet wounds. Maybe the lobster costume had dulled their impact. And maybe they had given him some heavy-duty drugs at the hospital that jacked him up and allowed him to break down the door to the holding area. Now he was here to get his revenge on his assailant by frightening him. As improbable as all that seemed, I had to consider that it was possible. And so I couldn't, wouldn't shoot him. And after all, Louis couldn't do more than frighten Joel, right? Steel bars stood between them. I said, freeze and put your hands up. Louis closed each of his giant claws around four bars and snapped them in half with a metallic crunch. With his wiggling legs, he peeled them aside, creating an opening into the cell. Then he began shuffling inside as Joel shrank back into a corner. This, certainly, was all a good argument in favor of shooting Louis. God forgive me, I muttered and pulled the trigger, aiming at Louis's segmented tail. The shot landed, and a spurt of green slime oozed out of the wound, but it did nothing to slow Louis down. And then it was too late. Louis was upon Joel, grasping the frightened boy with its legs. Joel let out one final cry as Louis opened a pincer in front of Joel's neck. He said simply, no. Then Louis snapped his claw shut and Joel's head toppled from his neck and down onto the dingy jail floor in a gush of blood. His body slumped down beside it. I unloaded my clip in a frenzy. Louis jerked with the impact of each shot, flailing his legs, and I was reminded, grotesquely, of his performance at halftime earlier that night. Only here, there was no cheering crowd and nothing to celebrate. Louis fell to the ground, supine next to Joel's body, opened his claws one more time, slowly, and then closed them forever. Meanwhile, a hideous maw opened under Louis's twitching antennae, and I recoiled as a green fog began spewing out of it. I kept dumbly pulling the trigger of my gun at the substanceless fog, though the bullets were all spent. In terror, I remembered Joel's story, about how the green fog had seeped into Noah's mouth when they had broken into the janitor's closet. I kept my mouth sealed tight and backed down the hallway. But the fog wasn't moving towards me. It drifted over to the sink, swirled around in the basin for a moment, and then shot up and into the faucet. This is The Curator. I hope you've enjoyed part two of today's scary story. Click part three to continue this tale.